So we have here a special guest today and a returning co-host. My friend Shannon Braswell returns to things hidden after uh, some time away, but he has made it back. And we're glad to have Shannon Braswell join us from Seattle, Washington, as well as our, our honored guest, Jean-Michel Ugolian. How, how are you doing? Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm I'm doing fine trying to survive the virus and, 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 and the various problems including old age. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, uh, you were a co-author of the book things hidden since the foundation of the world by Rene Girard, which really. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. That was a long time ago. And I, and I, and I think it's more prescient now than ever for us to look at that book and other books in that work that you and, and Mr. And uh, professor Girard did, you know, cause I feel like we're living in a world in which, you and him wrote the screenplay for the movie we're in right now, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> that's one way there. Very interesting, David, to look at it because really uh, Rene uh, had this feeling that we were about to enter apocalyptic times. He had this very strong feeling and we, we were, he was animated by this thought when we wrote that book uh, between 1970 Three in 1978, the book came out in French in 78, and then was later published a year or two later by uh, by Stanford University Press. And after that, I wrote a few books that were translated into uh, English and published by Michigan State University Press. And the last one called Alterity is in the process of being translated now also by Michigan State University Press, should be published soon. And there is another one called The Work That Heals. And uh, it is uh, in the process also of being translated and published in the States. So uh, I'm glad that the American people ha have an opportunity to, you know, to, to take a look at my further works. Yeah. So tell us again, the first title of the book you just mentioned, the first one you mentioned, the new one. The alterity, in other okay. words, the the fact that, 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 that the there is no such a, a thing as a person living on its own. Okay. Everything is interrelational. Everything is relational. Everything is alt, uh, alterity, you know, going backwards and forwards between two people or more. I see. Interesting. And we do not exist just on our own. Right. And, and the, the disaster in our world now is that many young people and many philosophers develop this idea that we are all on our own and we can decide who we are, what we are, what we want to do, whether we want to be a man or a woman or a child or an animal or whatever. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we have to make that decision on our own and that the only, uh, the only purpose of our life is to be as happy and, and fulfilled all our desires, which is ridiculous because this is paving the way to hell. Right. Yeah. So that's what the book is. Is it kind of a psycho psych psychological analysis or is it you're going in a different field or? No, no, no. I, you know, I've always kept every all, all the time in psychology and psychopathology and psychotherapy. I mean, all along my job. I've never went out of my job except once uh, for my book, which was published in the States called Psychopolitics. And when I applied psychology to politics. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, and, yeah, then that, and, then, that, that, that. and then you said the one that heals the, the book. The, what's the other book? How the work that heals the work that heals. Is, well, you see, this is a study which I've made by visiting and uh, studying three plants, three industries, okay? Yeah. That employ only handicapped people. But by handicapped, I don't mean people without a leg or an arm. It is psychologically handicapped people. In other words, my field, the kind of people I had the experience with in 
psychiatric hospitals. And these people are integrated and gradually put to work and they, you know, they're uh, gradually taught simple gestures and more and more complicated gestures to fabricate things. And at the end, they fabricate all the necessary electronic equipment for the cars. So it's quite impressive to see these people and to ask them the question, if I pay you just as much, would you rather stay at home and relax and watch television? Oh, please, no. My work that I have now discovered makes me feel I am somebody. Right. Makes me feel I live, gives, gives a meaning to my life, and I feel integrated. Right. They are very happy with that. In other words, the, the, the summary of the book is that the work in such a nice, protected uh, surrounding is much more healing and much more helpful for psychologically disabled people than being in a psychiatric hospital. Huh. Yeah. So it's, very, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. So uh, lots of people in France, lots of industries have uh, been interested by the work. They have been uh, induced to, uh, you know, to hire uh, handicapped people and gradually put them into the circuit. And uh, so I think that it's good that it's also translated into English. Yeah, that's good. So that it's a, it, does it employ mimetic psychology and the understanding of what's of course, happening? Yeah. The whole thing is built on mimetic psychology because the key issue is that the person that comes in is taught by the person that's going to leave that particular working place. So therefore, by doing that gradually, you avoid mimetic rivalry between the teacher and the one that's learning because the one that's learning wants to learn and the one that teaches has no interest staying where he is. He wants to move over and so on and so forth. So really the mimetic rivalry, which is very toxic in every way, in all human relations, the mimetic rivalry is avoided. And once it is avoided, it's a very healing process for the mind. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So I thought that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. It's quite, and, 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 and what is important is that I have interviewed about 700 workers like this. And, uh, and some of them were in incredibly, uh, you know, interesting. One of them, for instance, was the chief of, at the end of the circuit. She was responsible for looking at the uh, computer board. Yeah. Wire that was going to go to the to the factory to, the, to, to, put, to be put in the car. And that was a series of letters and, 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 and figures, I mean, uh, like A, B, 7, C, uh, 1, 0, 0, and so on. So on. And uh, I was very impressed how quickly she could do that, compare, and if the comparison was fine, if everything was okay, she would just send it. If there was anything not exactly the same, she would reject it. And I said, but how can you read so fast? I tried to read this, you know, this same and do the same work. It took me a hell of a lot of time to check, you know, one after the other one thing. And she said, because you see, my handicap, my mental ha handicap is that I have never been able to read or write. I can't read and I can't write. And I said, how do you do it? 
She said, I learned to photograph. I take a mental picture and I see if it adjusts and if it corresponds to between the two things. And it's very quick. And she said, this allowed me to lead a better normal life every day because my friends and family would, because before I didn't know where I was because I couldn't read the names of the streets. But then they took me, for instance, to a street and I photographed and they said, this is, for instance, uh, you know, Washington Avenue. <laughs> this is, the, and, and, and that's how, and, and that was amazing, you know, this, this lady had been labeled mentally handicapped, unable to do anything because she couldn't read or write. And now she is really doing the most difficult job. Wow. Something that would take so much more time for, for a normal person who reads and writes to compare the, the, the figures. Yeah. That's just one example. That's interesting. Mm. Love to check out that book. That'll be exciting to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, when is that? When is that expected to come? When are those two books expected to come out in America? Do you know? Yeah, I think in about six months. Both of them? No, because uh, you know, you know, I mean, the editors are yeah. The, the translators take time, and the editors take time, and, and the publishers take time. <laughs> but uh, finally, I think in the beginning of the twenty-two. And of course, everybody, all this is very handicapped by the virus because many employees and many workers do not come, cannot come, uh, cannot come to work. So, so they all work on, on, on TV and so on, but it, it's, it's, it's not as quick as, as it could be. Can I, uh, can uh, I, can I, uh, uh, ask, I wanted to ask a question about the idea of ind individualism, which you spoke about a little bit earlier. You know, um, there's there's some people. You know, there, there's some positives, I guess, with individualism. You know, being your own person, kind of going out to do your own thing. And then there's also, I think, sort of a negative um, to, to to being an individual because sometimes you can get into you know negative things, or or you know, you think you think that you're being an individual, but it, but you're you're just copying the same things that other people are doing. So like, for instance, we talked about, you talked about, you know, a, a man who thinks he's a woman, right? So this is like my own identity, you know, or I say, well, I don't want to be labeled as a black person. I, you know, I don't want to be labeled as a black man. I just want to be myself, right? So how does that, how, how, how do those two things work? Because it's like, well, I can say, Yes, I'm 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 a black man, but I'm also an you know my own person, right? I like to think of myself as being an individual, right? But I also know that I I, I copy other people. So well, first of all, you know the mimetic uh, psychology. Uh, we we called it with Rene Girard interdividual psychology, mm -hmm. not inter individual but interdividual. In other words, we don't think there are individuals. Mm -hmm. Nobody is alone. Mm -hmm. That's the first remark. So every, every one of us exists mainly through the relationship he is able to establish with the next person, another person, male or female or whatever, and to, to learn from that person. I mean, we learn from our parents, we learn from our teachers, and then we learn from our siblings, and then we learn from our, what we read. And for instance, if you read René Girard, you're going to read René Girard and learn about him, what he is able to give you. In fact, you take what you want to take from him. You know, he, he is dead, so he can't force you to, <laughs> to, to accept this, that, or that idea. But you can read it and pick up what you want. That's the first observation. The second observation is that this individualism, I think, is connected to the fact that nowadays our world has lost transcendence. You see, in the past, 
uh, in the Jewish religion, the Jews thought, felt they were created by God. In other words, the individual existence was connected to something above, you see. Then the Christian religion, of course, was not only connected to something above, but Christ recommended that we connect to each other, love your neighbor, love your sibling, lo love the other as much as I've loved you. You see, this, this was this message. And then, of course, the Muslim religion, the same thing. Uh, we are all created by God, and it's God that has given us the rules that we have to follow. And you see, then all this transcendental thinking gives you the, the, uh, you know, gives you the feeling that you belong to something greater than your own little self. But since you re eliminate transcendence in those days, in our new world, of course, you find yourself all alone. And th this makes you, in my opinion, makes you miserable makes you miserable. This is why the young people are so miserable that they take refuge in drugs and in violence, you know? Yeah. And because uh, this is the first time probably uh, in, in the history of mankind, in my opinion, that drugs are used so widely uh, in order to, to uh, Drugs plus the uh, plus the uh, social, you know, Instagram and Facebook and everything. Those youngsters want to live in the virtual world. Yeah. They are not living in the real world. So reality today is the key issue. Whether we want to be in reality or whether we want to kid ourselves by being living in, in, in another world. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know whether I've, I've answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I think that's a, that's a good analysis. I mean, uh, you know, I'm thinking, um, you know, you talked about me? you talked about uh, you know social media like being the the yeah. kind of yeah. gateway into you know um, uh, having having meaning in your life, you know, and things like that. Do you do you yeah, think do. yeah do, do you think that there is a connection to say like you know finding pleasure in you know with drugs or social media or you know say pr promiscuity that these things are connected to say like a fear of dying you know a fear of death or a fear of not being connected to others you know no i think i think these youngsters and unfortunately, all the our contemporaries, they are not afraid to die. They are afraid to live. What scares them is to live. And they, they can't live so that they take refuge in virtual reality. They cannot face reality and live the real life. <coughs> That I think is the the real disease of our time, and and it's quite quite uh, especially in the in what we call the West, in other words, America and Europe. Um, I think China probably has a completely different situation, but I don't know anything about China. Yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> This idea of being afraid to live has been brought to the forefront during this pandemic. You know, and I, I know people in Australia, they're locked down. They can only get one hour of exercise a day outside of their home, and they can only go one kilometer outside of their home. They are allowed only six beers a, a, a day or a week. I don't know which one. Six beers, and the government will look through their groceries to make sure they don't have more than six beers because I guess beers – if you have seven beers, that might give you the virus, you know, but uh, they, they have they have uh, different situations where the government is now able. I just heard from an Australian. They passed a, a, a law or something where they can now 
uh, pretend to be a friend of yours on social media. They can, uh, they can assume the identity of someone, you know, and basically they call that catfishing in America. They can take on the identity of somebody else and, and they can do that for whatever the reason they want. They have QR codes that you have to scan in to get into any cafe or coffee shop. What is going on in this world? <laughs> well, I tell you, uh, I think this is disastrous, really. That, uh, you know, now the, 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 the only thing the government orders us to do is not anything like be brave, do something, work, do something artistic, produce something. No, 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 no. The only thing we want you to do is to stay alive. Yeah. And it's not so much we want you to stay alive. We want you not to die. Yeah. Which in their brain is not exactly the same thing. We don't care in which condition you, you live, but don't die. Yeah. You see? And so this, in my opinion, at least in France, is due not to the fear of the virus. Is due to the fear of justice, because all those politicians are afraid to be sued by people who will say, you didn't give us enough warning, you didn't lock us up enough, and therefore my grandfather died of the virus. So you're responsible. And the justice will, will lock them up or give them whatever, and they will be in a mess. And this has already started. So now, you know, it's, we're, we're, this virus has really completely uh, uh, sort of changed the whole mentality of, of the politicians and the people. I, I, I want to I know what you think uh, Rene Girard would think of all this stuff. I mean, right now we have a polarization in America where people who are, have vaccinated, they are, some of them are gleeful when they hear about someone who's unvaccinated dying of, of the virus. They, they say, look, that serves them right. They deserve to die if they don't want to take this uh, prescribed medicine. This is very Girardian to me, <laughs> this idea of polarization and the plague of scapegoats. And now Biden has announced that yeah. 100 million people, uh, if you work for a company of 100 employees or more, you must get this King's decreed medicine or else lose your job or be subjected to intrusive nasal swabs every week just to maintain your job. This is very disturbing. I think this is a mimetic mania, perhaps. It is, absolutely. And, you know, uh, it is mimetic media. It is mimetic rivalry spread around. And uh, it, it is also fear. It is fear. They are afraid of the virus. They are afraid uh, of the justice. They are afraid of what people might say. They are afraid to contaminate people. They are afraid of being contaminated. This is why they all want to have masks and things and just be as far from the other as possible. And this is where my book on alterity might be of interest in this period of time. You know, I see. How, how do you see this book kind of addressing some of these issues? Would you give us a little preview maybe <laughs> for our audience to read it more? No, no, uh. no, no. But uh uh, no, I think I think the book is a, sort of a summary of uh, all my theories. You know, for the past uh, fifty years, I've been working fifty years in this right. area, and I've never gone out of my my field, which is psychiatry and psychology and psychopathology and psychotherapy. And but I think some people. Uh, the, these ideas are beginning to sink into some minds, yeah. but they are difficult to accept for the majority of the people because it is extremely difficult for any person to accept the idea that the desire, which I think is mine, is actually copied on somebody else's. Right. It's very difficult to accept that, you see, whereas... Yeah. It's quite obvious, for instance, in publicity, 
that if you want to sell a perfume, you're not going to send girls around in the streets and have it, you know, have ladies smell the perfume and see how good it is. You just put, you know, a, a big star saying, I am my perfume is, you know, the first one who did that was Marilyn Monroe. If you remember, when they asked her what she was wearing at night to sleep, she said Chanel number no. five. And the next day, Chanel number no. five, you know, was sold in billions of copies. That, that makes me want to ask you then, what about what's going to happen with people like Victoria's Secret, where they're getting obese models now? <laughs> Have you heard of this? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, they what kind of desire models. is that going to create? <laughs> no, it's an excuse. It's an excuse, you know. It's an excuse. And I think this is very dangerous because if you, if you convince people that being obese can also be very exciting and sexy, uh, you're going to develop all sorts of diseases that stem from obesity, like hypertension, diabetes, and all sorts of things like that. Let me give you one little story. My daughter told me that here comes a lady, very obese, to the point that she could hardly walk and was supported by her older son and husband on each side. And my daughter examines her and she says, lady, you have all the symptoms of obesity, you know, because you eat too much. You have hypertension, you have diabetes, you have problems in the eyes, you have problems in the kidneys, so, so forth. So please, you have to diet. And the lady says, no, doctor. I cannot diet. This is beyond me. This is beyond what I can do. Mm -hmm. All I want you to do is prescribe me a wheelchair. Wow. Can, can you can you believe that? Wow. They don't care about their health. They want you know to be in a wheelchair and able to to eat everything. <laughs> well, that's just like I what was they very do. impressed. Yeah, that's the same thing going on with the pandemic. They 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 don't tell people to get sunshine. They don't tell people to get exercise. They don't tell people to stop eating vegetable oils and sugar. But they will tell you just get the get the get the vaccination and sit at home and, and wait till we tell you to come outside, basically. Yeah. yeah well, the thing, the key issue is this. You see, if you want the he, mankind to go forward. You have to encourage them to live a very intense life and do something with their lives. But now they're not, they are not encouraged to that. They're just encouraged to stay home and stay alive. That's all we want you to do. Well, they don't have to stay alive. If you die of suicide, they don't care. They just don't want you to die of this disease. That's it. You know, <laughs> that's right. right. You, you, you can die of anything you want, but not from the virus. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this when, is very strange. So does this look like apocalyptic the way you and Gerard were looking at the apocalyptic times? Does this look like what you would expect in an apocalyptic time? Or is this a little bit different than what you guys would probably, you know, I mean, obviously you're not Nostradamus. You're looking at anthropology. You're looking at psychology, but yeah. does this look apocalyptic? I, to you? It's apocalyptic in the sense that it's, it's the, it's the revelation of, of, of all the fears anxieties and uh, uh, and problems of mankind, you know, all comes to light. Before it was hidden by realizations, you know, like we want to go to the moon, we want to do this, we want to do that. Now we just don't want to do anything. We just want to stay at home <laughs> and try to stay alive. <laughs> and as you said, we can die if, if we wish, but certainly not from the virus, yeah. <laughs> because that would be that would be used against the politicians. This is why, for instance, now Joe Biden is getting mad at the 80 million Americans who do not want to va be vaccinated, and in France, Macron is getting wild and 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 crazy about the 30 percent French people who manifest every Saturday in the streets, saying we don't want to be vaccinated because we want to be free. And he tries to tell them, but if you want to be free, get the vaccinations, then you can be free of doing what you want. And they say, no, we want to be free to die, you know. 
he he doesn't want them to be free to die. <laughs> Isn't this what we would describe as victimism, where this Christian concern for victims is mixed in with sacrificial violence? You know, we will save you from yourself or else you can't have access to society, you know? Exactly, exactly, exactly. The, uh, now everybody, you see, there is now before in in history there was a competition between heroes a competition between heroes but now there is a competition between victims every person wants to be more victim than the other you're unhappy i'm more unhappy yeah. you're poor i'm even poorer you're sick i'm sicker you know i am more victim than you are yeah and no i'm a woman therefore i'm a victim yeah, uh, I'm black, therefore I'm a victim. Uh, I'm uh, whatever, homosexual, I'm a victim. Anything that's specific to you is a bit, makes you a victim. But if you are white, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, you know, so, so, then you're not a victim. Then you're you're a culprit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but isn't it true that according to you know? your book things hidden that basically the more you scapegoat one particular group, the more it backfires. So the more they try to scapegoat white heterosexual, you know, Protestant or Christian males, the more it's going to eventually backfire and people will be less believing of their narrative. Right. Isn't that how it works? Absolutely. You know, and the problem is that the more you, you try to create scapegoats, you create victims, but now the victims scapegoat the 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 the, the, the accusers. Right. See what I mean? They they, they reverse the thing. Uh, the, the the one that is accusing you and trying to victimize you becomes himself uh, a culprit and the victim and, and the scapegoat himself. Yeah. So we're in in a, in a actually we're we're in a very 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 perturbed world. I think the world is a hair wire. Uh, so, and if you look around the planet, you see that, you know, uh, there's really something that's, that's going on. That's apocalyptic in the sense that it reveals everywhere what is worst in mankind. Yeah. You know, fear, anxiety, Cowardice, uh, lack of drive, tribalism, fear of right? Yeah. Excuse me. Tribalism. Yeah, yeah. All those things you see that are not very constructive and not, uh, and are very, very, very different. Of course, we have been, you know, uh, we have been traumatized by two big world wars and. With uh, America has been traumatized by Vietnam and now by Afghanistan and so on. Uh, so, of course, there are some reasons for what's happening. And, of course, the virus has attacked the world, the whole world. And they are trying now to find a scapegoat that can be accused of producing the virus. And they have found it. It's China. Yeah. And the struggle with it is the Chinese virus. That the Chinese, you know, uh, created and invented to destroy uh, the, the the rest of the world. So everybody tries to find a scapegoat. In America, right uh, now, but, mostly it's the unvaccinated. Biden says, you know, we are trying to protect the vaccinated from the unvaccinated. It's like, why do they need protection if they're vaccinated? That means it's supposed to work, right? <laughs> it does. If if you need if you get a product and, it, and you still need to be protected from the disease the product's is supposed to stop, then that means the product's not working or or, or you're scapegoating exactly. people. Absolutely, absolutely, because you see, all those scientists do not agree exactly on the 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 the, <clears throat> the results of the vaccination. <coughs> uh, many of them think that if you are vaccinated. You still can be contaminated, but probably develop a less severe form of disease. And 
also that if you're vaccinated, you can still have the virus and contaminate somebody else. You have to protect yourself, protect the other. In other words, get away from each other. Get away from each other. <coughs> you know, uh, th 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 this is a big problem. This is a big problem. And uh, my idea as a doctor is that the, we should learn from AIDS. You know AIDS? Yeah. There was a vaccine found for AIDS, but there was a treatment found. And now I have AIDS patients who are living a very nice, pleasant life, normal, just by taking one pill a day. One pill a day. Ten years ago, they would, they would have to take ten a day. But gradually, they have made progress. And when I think today, the, the billions of dollars should be invested in finding a treatment for that virus. Because the vaccination, all over the world, the vaccination for any disease is never 100%. It depends on the way your antigens react. Right. But if you, have, if you have a treatment, you have a treatment. And that's it. <laughs> well, that's the thing is that a lot of those, uh, this, the, the sacred uh, public health officials, they are fundamentally unable to investigate treatments on the market right now that are generic and off label, off patent. Everything that they must find must be a new patentable drug where you can make billions of dollars. <laughs> right. Because you see, if they find an old medication that would work, they lose money. Right. And they certainly don't want to do that because now with the vaccines, they're making billions. Right. Yeah. So there's a mixture of politics, financial problems, you know, uh, population problems, everything. Uh, in many countries, like for instance, Brazil, uh, the, the, poli the, 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 the politicians are not now left or right, you know, as uh, classically, but they are pro or against the vaccine. Yeah. In France, we have your, the pro vaccine and the against vaccine. In America, the same thing. This is ridiculous, you know. Right. It's, it's because because you're debating politically about something that should be scientifically debated, that not not politically. It's not a political issue, but, but it's just proof how crazy the world has become. But it's a, it's also proof that the sacred still exists, right? Because the sacred is where Hello? the realm of politics is, and the sacred is contaminating all things, including science. You know. No, what 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 the problem is is that the sacred has disappeared. And as we wrote with René Girard and Things Hidden, when the sacred dis <clears throat> disappears, it tends to come back right. into the society in the form of violence. Right. Because yeah. it is the violence when it's taken out of the community and stored in a sacred place. But if you forget about the sacred, that nothing is sacred anymore, people have lost faith and everything, then the sacred tends to come back uh, to, into the society in the form of violence. And this is what we are seeing. Yeah. We're seeing violence developing in the States, in France, and of course, in places like the Middle East and, and Asia, and Africa, and so on. I mean, violence is something which is flourishing. Do you, do you see, you know, you, we have stand-up comedians like Jimmy Kimmel, late night show, saying that if you are unvaccinated, you shouldn't have access to the ICU room. I mean, this is classical victimism because it's trying to act, it's trying to outcompete Christianity. Christianity was the place that provided universal hospitals for everybody, no questions asked. And now this victimism is saying, no, we're more righteous than that. If you don't get what we tell you to get, you should be excluded from care, you know? Exactly. But at the same time, at the same time, it makes sense scientifically. Because if you're not vaccinated, 
and you get into an ICU unit, you can contaminate people who do not have the virus, but who have heart attacks or other things. But if they get the virus on top of their disease, then yeah. they're sure to die. Yeah. And then comes the justice because the families of those people who died will sue the guy yeah. saying this guy had the virus. He came into the thing, into the, the, the intensive care unit. He contaminated my grandfather. My grandfather died, so he is a criminal. So this makes life complicated. Yeah. How, 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 do, how do we get out of this mass psychosis that a lot of people are in, whether they're pro-establishment or anti-establishment? You're a psychiatrist. I guess maybe you know about exorcisms. How do we get a mass exorcism of the society? <laughs> I, I think this is beyond my capacity, this exorcism. But no, I really think that the day a pharmaceutical company will be charitable enough to produce a medication, well, you know, reasonably expensive, not too expensive, but they will sell billions and billions and billions. So they finally will make money. Then you see the problem will be solved. Look at all those diseases that were solved by, dis by, by medications. Yeah. Tuberculosis, I mean, uh, uh, all those uh, typhoid fever, you know. Yeah. I was myself, when I was two years old, I had typhoid fever and I was about to die. And at that time, precisely at that time, Penicillin was discovered in, this, in, in England by Professor Fleming. And I had the chance that my parents were able to get a little, a little bit of powder of penicillin, which saved my life. Wow. You see, so, I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's my own experience. If you have a, if you, if you have a medication, you, the problem is solved because then no, no one would be stupid enough if he has some symptoms not to take the medication. Right. Because then it's suicidal. Right. I, like I, today, if you have a headache, if you have a headache, everybody goes and gets some Tylenol or whatever. <laughs> yeah. No one says, no, no, I'm going to keep my headache because I'm free. No one said that. Yeah. <laughs> Shannon, do you have well, anything? Do you want to chime in real quick? Well, I wanted to ask about uh, this this question of uh, desire co desires and culture specifically. About um, you know, Renee Girard uh, said something about uh, you know particular cultures emphasizing certain desires. So, you know, he said something about like the Anglo-Saxon world. You know, has a has a their, their desires are market driven or economically driven. And they said that the Romanized world, the romantic world, the Latin world is driven by uh, romance or, you know, sexual desire. So do you, how, what do you, what is your take on that? Like, well, think I think of course, you know, when, when, when mimetic starts somewhere, it spreads around, you know, mm -hmm. this is what we call I don't know whether you use that word in English, mode, mode, fashion. Is that okay. fa fashion? Fashion. Mm -hmm. If you're in a place where everybody wears, you know, jeans, everybody wears blue jeans. Mm -hmm. if, we're, if you're in a place where everybody wears, I don't know, uh, ties, you wear a tie. And if you suddenly decide that no, ties are now out of date, out of place, you, you just take the ties you have, <laughs> you throw them away. Uh, no, I think it's it's very mimetic. It's very mimetic, and uh, it's true that uh, the Anglo-Saxon world is oriented mimetically into economic achievements, and, and because you see, they are Protestants. Most of them, they have a Protestant or Jewish mentality which doesn't condemn money. Whereas Catholicism, which is in Europe, 
uh, if you're rich, it's bad. You better be poor and good. <laughs> so, you see, <laughs> so you see, if you make too much money, it means that there's something wrong about your, <laughs> your purity. <laughs> Well, so maybe, you can be a poor I, Romeo, right? It's better to be a poor Romeo. Yeah. A Don Juan. You have to be, yeah, you have to be a poor Romeo <laughs> and not the Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, I, I well, really anyway. appreciate I really appreciate your time. I know it's the 20th anniversary of 9-11 that we're talking. So I wanted to ask you in light of that, as we reflect on this 20 years of war on terror. You are involved with helping people uh, who continue to be victims of terror and oppression in different ways in the Middle East. And I wanted you to speak a little bit about that as we wrap up here. You know? if... Well, I tell you, I think that now the reason why the West has lost the last few wars is that the West tries to have what they call zero dead war. They want to make war, kill the others, but not have any casualties because they are afraid to die. But in fact, they are not only afraid to die, but they are also afraid to live. Whereas the others that, they, that are fighting in order to kill their enemies. In other words, not only they are not afraid to die, but they are elated to die. Yeah. They wish to die. They are happy to die. And you cannot fight somebody. You see, if somebody wants to kill you, it's very difficult to avoid. But if somebody wants to kill you by killing himself, you can't avoid it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that we're, we're in that kind of situation. In other words, if we want to win, the future wars, we have to make an excruciating reappraisal of our cultural approach to all those problems. Yeah. The way we feel, the way we want to live, the way we want to die, what do we believe? There is no question to win any, any more wars. Yeah. Because wars are built on belief. The belief is what makes people, you know, courage, gives within people courage. But, you know, the American soldiers, I'm sure most of them in Afghanistan, they don't really knew what the hell they were doing there. Yeah. And that's terrible. That's terrible. That's terrible. And we French, now we are in Africa, you know, trying to come to, to fight terrorism in, in Central Africa. Some of the soldiers the hell they are doing in the middle of the desert trying to chase, you know, people. In a territory, there are 3,000 soldiers chasing people that are running around the territory as vast as the whole of Europe. Wow. So in other words, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. If you want to win such a war, you have to send 200 million soldiers. There's no such a thing. Yeah. Wow. It's a culture war. We have to change our mentalities. We'll let you go because I, I, I think we've uh, covered enough ground today, but I want to, maybe we'll do these discussions more often, you know, instead of once a year. <laughs> Okay, well, listen, I hope that maybe one day we'll visit, you'll visit me in Paris. Yeah, I'd love to. So we yeah. can we'll make it live. Yeah. Or else the virus would allow us to do it. Maybe you, one day I'll visit, I'll visit you in Florida. Yeah, if you ever come to see your daughter, let us know, and we'll, we'll uh, take you uh, to tour the beaches or oranges or whatever you like, orange groves. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I look forward to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank take you. Care. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.